Okay, good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, as you can see, we're still waiting for one more panelist. She just texted me to say that she's cycling in and she's stuck in the traffic caused by the taxi strike. But she should be here within the next 15 minutes or so. Um, so, uh, the purpose of today's event is to discuss a report that the Centre has published on the impact of the GDPR on AI. And then we want to talk through the opportunities for um, either European leadership in AI or, or whatever other opportunities there are in Europe for AI to, to improve the European economy. Um, now joining me is Richard Middleton from the Association of Financial Markets in Europe, Luc Bersini from the University of Lille de Bruxelles, uh, and Karina Schulze from SAP. Um, and as I said, within the next 15 minutes or so, we should also have uh, Victoria de Poisson from FDI Consulting. And my name is Nick Wallace, and I'm a senior policy analyst at the Centre for Data Innovation. Um, before I kick off the debate, I thought I'd just sort of start by going through the key findings and key arguments of our report. Uh, you should all have copies of it. I, I left them by the door. Um, but I would say that the aspect of the GDPR that we find most troubling when it comes to AI is the very specific restrictions on algorithmic decision making. Um, so the GPS says that an algorithmic decision that may have legal or similarly significant effects, um, which is quite a broad, a broad category of decisions, um, first of all should always be subject to a human review, so you have a right not to be subject to a wholly automated decision in those circumstances. And a much more con confusing and, and nebulous right in there is that it says there is a right to meaningful information of the logic involved in the algorithm. Now, there, there's some debate about what that, what that actually means and what that's actually giving you a right to, and we'll get up onto that in the, in the discussion. But our concern at the centre is that um, it, first of all, places human and algorithmic decisions on a very different footing, um, because it's, it's, I mean, it's the result of a concern about unfairness, about bias that could harm consumers. Um, but it's, it seems to be based on a misunderstanding of, of where algorithmic bias comes from, um, and also a misunderstanding of human biases, um, and, and the human decisions, I would argue, being much, often much harder to explain and to scrutinize. Um, there's, there's also a problem which is inherent not, not only in the possible right to explanation, which as they say is under debate, but also the right to a human review, which is, which is quite clear in the GDPR. There is a trade-off in, in, in computer science between the, 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 the sophistication, the representational capacity of an algorithmic model and the capacity of a person to understand it, because the, the more variables that are being involved, uh, the more complex the analysis, inherently the more difficult it becomes to, to interpret. Um, and our fear is, is that this requirement in the GDPR may, especially in the, in the most significant circumstances, either push companies not to use AI at all, or to use substandard algorithms that are easier to explain, but may produce less accurate and therefore potentially less fair decisions. So that's the, the, sort of the first two points that you'll see in the report, and I would say that the, 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 if you want to sort of pick out the, key, the, the most important things that we're concerned about, it would be those. Um, there are also other problems with, so there's the right to erasure of information. The GDPR doesn't specify deletion, it says erasure, which is quite different from simply deleting data. Um, and depending on how it's interpreted, depending on how it's applied, um, could damage existing algorithmic models in ways that harm consumers who are already who are remaining in the system who are not removing their data. Um, fourth concern we have is that the general prohibition on repurposing data um, will harm innovation in AI. In AI will harm um, people. In, in, it will discourage companies from from finding new ways to. Um, to deploy algorithms. Obviously, this is not a new restriction in the GDPR. This exists already in European law. Um, we think a more sensible way to do this would be to have consent rules with regards to sharing data with, you know, for example, if data is transferred to another controller, um, 
with the exception of cases such as mergers, then, then, then you should probably seek the consent of the data subject. But we're not convinced it's necessary to do that in every single instance of repurposing. Um, the other is, is something that could have been a, a, a quite good in the GDPR is that it creates two tiers for pseudonymization and anonymization. Um, you have slightly relaxed rules for pseudonymized data and anonymized data which is completely exempt from the GDPR. Um, that's a good thing. Uh, the problem is at the moment the criteria in the GDPR for when data can or cannot be considered anonymized is, is not very clear. It's, it's based on things that might happen in the future, which puts um, AI companies on, on quite unsteady ground when it comes to saying this data is anonymized and we're going to process it accordingly. Um, our sixth concern is, is the general complexity of, of the GDPR. Um, this, I mean, it's, it's been described by one analyst by, by Christopher Kuhner at, at BUB, which is the other free university of Brussels. Um, he, he described it as the most complex piece of regulation the EU has ever adopted. Um, that's, I'm, I'm cautious of superlatives, but I, I, I understand why he thinks that. Uh, it is a very complicated piece of legislation, um, which will simply make processing large data sets and processing AI more complicated and more expensive and therefore less attractive to do it in Europe and more attractive to do it outside Europe, um, which is a concern. Um, then there's also the regulatory risks, uh, the, 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 the costs of fairly minor breaches can be extortionate. They, they also penalise small companies above large companies because the fines are, it's, it's 20 million euros or 4% of global turnover, whichever is higher. So if you're a big company, well that's 4% of your turnover, but if you're a small company, that's 20 million euros, which could be a hell of a lot more than 4% of your turnover. Um, the other is that, and again, this is somewhere where there has been some improvement relative to the what was there before the GDPR, but there's still a problem, is data localization rules. I say there's been improvement in the sense that the GDPR, at least for the first time, stops uh, member states from restricting the flow of data from one member state to another, which is progress. But there are still quite strong restrictions on, on transferring data outside the EU. Now, it's true that, that since the GDPR was adopted, the Commission um, does seem to be moving slowly towards um, a, a more pragmatic approach to this. But the GDPR still says what it says, and obviously the Commission can only work within, within those constraints. Um, data localization does not protect privacy. Uh, good cyber security does. Proper accountability for companies operating inside your borders does. Um, but where you store the data is, is really not a primary concern. Um, but it does raise the cost of, um, of, of processing data sets. One thing because it harms competition between cloud services providers. Um, so it will have an indirect effect on AI. It's, it's, it's not as <coughs> strong effect, for example, as, as, as the direct restrictions on algorithmic decision-making, but this is some of the background context that we think is going to make AI more costly to do. Um, finally, um, I've been quite negative so far, so I want to finish on a high note. Um, we think the rules on data portability, for the most part, will stimulate competition between AI services in Europe, in the sense that companies who are currently incumbent have large amounts of data, it will be easier for people who are customers of those companies to take their data and move it somewhere else, which may even be to a smaller company that doesn't currently have access to that data. So in terms of freeing up the flow of data um, and, and allowing customers to, to really shop around between different kinds of companies, um, we think that's good. Um, there is a cost to it in the sense that some of the data sets involved could be, I mean, they could be very large, they, they could be unstructured um, and, and pulling them together in a way that is useful to the customer in some cases could be very high especially if lots of people do it um, so there, there is there is sort of a there is a compliance burden there but I, I don't want to dwell too much on that because as I said I wanted to end on a, on a, on a positive note um, so that's that's the sort of the, the central argument of our report. I'm going to dive into the discussion now. I think 
sticking with the positive note to kick us off, um, what do the panellists think are the most important opportunities for deploying AI in Europe? Where can we do really well at this? And I'm going to go, I, I normally never go down the line on a panel, but I'm going to do that this time. I'm going to start with Richard and we'll go to Ubi and go to Karina. Uh, please on. Oh, yeah, that one. Um, so, um, so I'm at the Association for Financial Markets in Europe, so that's um, representing trade association representing banks operating in Europe, whether they're European, uh, UK, US, the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, one of the areas that we see uh, very important for use of AI is there's so much data now that um, so many trades going on every day, every minute, and firms compliance teams internally uh, have obligations to um, identify any areas that they might find suspicious transactions to make sure that they stop them, uh, so fraud, anti-money laundering, etc. Um, and the enormous amount of data you know, needs those sort of AI type solutions in order to process it uh, in a fast enough way to, to catch these things early enough. So uh, if I pick um, one thing for starters in, in, uh, in financial services, um, the um, opportunities for improved compliance, I think, would be, would be uh, good. Uh -huh. well, well, I'd like to make a, a small distinction uh, with, uh, because whenever you're teaching AI for more than 30 years, yeah, there is uh, today uh, a big bifurcation taking place in AI. And I think it's important to mention that between the machine learning AI and the non-machine learning one, and then more and more people are reducing all AI to the machine learning AI, or even uh, people are saying that AI is just deep learning. Uh, and I think this is plenty wrong, you know. Even in the 50s, there was these two kinds of AI, but this bifurcation has never been as great as, 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 as before. And, and it's important that most of the discussion we will have is on this machine, this couple of machine learning plus big data AI, which I think is, is theoretically a very small chapter of AI, just to, you know, make this distinction clear. Your GPS isn't at all a machine learning AI. Watson, you know, the famous Watson, when he defeated uh, the best players in the Geopoly game was at, not at all a machine learning AI. It's still a very important chapters of AI, but most of the discussion we have is on a very small chapters of AI, but which is making all the news today, which is making all the buzz, which is this machine learning AI, all right? So it's important to make this distinction because I'm not teaching, for instance, a lot of machine learning in my course. Therefore, I'm teaching a lot of AI. So uh, with respect to the question, no, I believe that uh, anywhere where you have a smart somewhere, you know, an expression beginning with smart is, is a very nice place for AI, like smart city. In my lab, we're doing a lot of uh, uh, research on, uh, for instance, uh, public transportation in, in terms modality, you know, how, how you switch from uh, uh, one public transport to another one. It's a lot of AI because you have to make uh, optimization, uh, you use a lot of classical AI algorithms. Machine learning also is important because you have to compile the data and make uh, a good usage of those data. Uh, a second chapter, for instance, is smart grid. You know, this is another uh, very nice place for AI because we go through this uh, energy transformation where the way we're going to consume and produce energy will be highly different in the years to come. This is a very nice place for AI because you have to optimize and, uh, and also learn about the consumer type of behavior. Smart medicine, obviously. So uh, whenever you have smart somewhere, you can put AI in it. Thanks a lot. Good morning, everybody. The comfortable position being at the end of the panel is that you can agree with um, so what we said on the importance of, of, of AI, um, yeah, I can, as I said, I can only agree. I mean, as, as SAP, we're a business-to-business -business company, um, so we certainly see the opportunities there, also compared to other geographies. So um, we actually see potential in all different sectors, as you mentioned them already before, and we are actually um, quite optimistic about the different hubs we see in Europe. I mean, we especially see them in Berlin, in, in London, and in Paris. So um, there is certainly already a lot we can build on. But as such, I wouldn't restrict it to any special special sector. As you said, as long as it's smart, you can, you know, you can certainly leverage the opportunity there. Great, and I think the other general question I wanted to ask the whole panel before I get into specifics um, 
is, I, I, I don't know how many people in the room know this, but the, the Commission's actually working on, on its AI strategy now, and I think it's due to publish towards the end of next month. Um, and, I mean, I don't know what's in there yet, but um, if we were playing a kind of a, whatever the policy version of fantasy football is, um, what would the panellists like to see the Commission prioritise in its AI strategy? I mean, what, what should be at the... I mean, assuming that the law governing AI and personal data, that is, you know, GDPR and, 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 and any other rules affecting this, are constant, what should the Commission's priorities be in terms of policy, the law being what it is? I think I'll start at Karina and we'll go this way. So, uh, yes, indeed, uh, we, we expect the Commission to come out with, uh, you know, uh, ideas, uh, communication on, on AI by the end of next month. Um, what we heard so far and what we found very positive was that um, there doesn't seem to be a notion of looking any at any new legislation, but that they're looking at the acquis and what is already out there. And we think that's really a good approach because um, we obviously do have a lot of legislation already, so we think it is really, first of all, necessary to, to look at the status quo and see to what extent this can already work uh, today. Because um, obviously, as, as a company, you're always at the receiving end when it comes to legislation, and you have to respect all of it. And if there are several layers, and some of them even uh, contradictory, then you, you have a problem um, in terms of compliance. Uh, having said that, um, Concerning uh, the GDPR, we think that it addresses most of um, the ethical and legal problems that might arise, and, and so again, we think um, this is certainly from a data protection perspective, and um, as we Germans <coughs> like to call it, the informational self-determination, which is very important for us. Uh, certainly the framework which is best fitted to address that already, and so we're, we're certainly in favor of, of not adding any additional layer of um, legislation there. And we have to first of all see how it works in practice. I mean, we are all very busy implementing the GDPR from May 25th this year. Um, so, and, and for the other areas like um, liability as well, I mean, there, there are lots of, there's lots of legislation out there, so we, we actually agree with the Commission to really look at what is, what is out there and see how this can work, and then afterwards, you know, um, do an evaluation if there's anything we are, we are missing, right? Is there an area which is not protected where we think, you know, we, um, we need anything in addition, or can we make what we have today work? in this new context. But obviously also for us it's very important to have the flexibility. So adding another layer of legislation would obviously have an impact on that, on the flexibility we would need. So we are, yeah, looking forward to the, I would call it communication first of all. That is in the pipeline. So, what would you like to see in the strategy? Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to discuss the uh, legislation activity of the European Commission, but the, the I believe that you know working again in a in a AI lab, and um, I was in Canada uh, last week, and the Canadian uh, government, not even the Canadian one, just the Quebec one, French part of Canada, we're going to invest one million, one one billion of dollars in a, in a, in many AI uh, type of activities, and I and I and I think that we have to resist today. Uh, what's happening in our know, AI business, you know, with the invasion of those monsters like Google, Facebook, and the famous GAFA and GAFA, and and, and it's and it's a pity, you know, and it's a, even a tragedy. But we're losing the battle of AI with respect to those monsters. So I believe that uh, we, as a European Commission, you know, they, they really have to foster to leverage uh, European, co uh, you know, collaborations and the collaborations among the many very good. You know, we were very good in the. 80s, and we're losing really the battle because even our best researchers were flying to uh, Canada or United States, if not China or Japan. And, the, and this is a tragedy, really. And uh, we don't have a scale. In any of the European countries, whatever, Belgium, France, Italy, there's a lot of efforts you know, for pushing AI in France, for instance. Uh, uh, Cédric Villani, perhaps you, you follow what happened. Macron invests a lot in AI, but this is just France. And I know all the AI lab in France, none of them makes more than 10 researchers. In Canada, 
uh, you, you take the Yoshua Benjo was, you know, interacting with him, you know, this deep learning, uh, uh, you know, researcher now. Uh, his lab grows from, uh, uh, he, he was 20 researchers in, four, you know, I think five years ago. No, it's 250 researchers. So multiplied by 10 in just, in just four years. We are not making this effort in Europe. We have no ways in any other country. None of the country can make this effort alone, but we really have to foster and you know, push much more than the European Commission is doing the collaboration among the AI lab in, you know, in Europe. Yeah, well, that sounds uh, well, I can agree now with uh, <coughs> my two panelists. Um, just to add a point on the, um, on the sort of regulation, I think that's sort of our view as well that um, you know, AI, big data, analytics, machine learning, etc. You know that fits into the current system of, of regulation, and I think the Commission's approach generally on on new initiatives is to see well is is a legislative initiative required or is some other initiative communication guidelines etc appropriate? And they, in my, in my experience, they don't sort of jump into legislation unless there's a you know really think it's necessary. It's been a proper impact assessment um, uh, to go to go with it. So I think. Um, one of the things that we've, we've seen also, I think, in the fintech um, work is that um, a lot of people have argued that if, if initiatives come in, they should be technology neutral. You know, it's very easy to sort of pick a new technology and say, oh, there's a problem with that. Um, but if you start legislating for very specific technologies, which are changing all the time, the legislative <laughs> process can't keep up with that. So you need a sort of more risk-based principles approach um, to whether it's initiative or a legislative proposal. Um, so I'm going to come back to that point on technology neutral policy in a little bit because it, it gets to some of the, th the things I wanted to discuss with algorithmic decision making and explainability in this coming. Mean, before I do that, I want to pick up on the point that Ud raised about foreign competition and, and how European, how Europe can compete with North America and, and I was going to say North America and Asia, but really I mean the US and China. Um, in AI, and I think I'm good, given that we've got a European software company represented at the table. I'm going to put this to Karina. What can European AI companies do to become global players? Because as as, as you point, pointed to, there's there's no shortage of AI companies in Europe. I mean, besides, I mean, obviously SAP, but European Standards is a very big company, and but there's there's also, I mean, I I, I often um, interview. <coughs> people from startups for our website and whenever we see uses of AI that we think are interesting and uh, we call these people up and we ask if they'll be interviewed and we write an article about it and I never have any difficulty finding really interesting small businesses um, doing new things with AI and, and there's huge numbers of them in London and Paris and Berlin um, but none of them seem destined to become global platforms in the way that um, you know, the Google or Facebook are, for example. So what can European companies do to try and achieve the kind of scale that we've seen in, in, in North America? Or also, what can European policymakers do to make, the, to make it easier for them to do that? Okay, um, so obviously we are, we are looking at, you know, what is, what is happening in other geographies, as you said, especially in China and, and North America. I'm not going to give now, you know, figures or whatever, but it is, it is a very impressive development. By the way, doing a bit of self-promotion, we have done a little report ourselves on artificial intelligence, um, where you have these figures in there. I left a couple of copies there. So this is why I'm not going to go into any details of what we see in, in, for example, China, only to say as much as that they are indeed investing a lot in, in research, and I couldn't agree more that this is obviously something where um, we should build on the joint forces of the EU, where the EU really matters, like in research, right? I mean, we, we, have, to, we have to build on the, the common strength that, that we have there and not see you know, the individual member states do it alone. That's not going to work. So this is certainly one, uh, the first recommendation I can, I can repeat, actually, that we need a, a common approach for, uh, for, for research. Um, then again, um, from a legal perspective, look at the framework that we already have. Maybe not, you know, 
uh, put it too much into question. Um, when it comes to the GDPR, we, we actually are um, trying to implement the underlying principles as much as we can, obviously, and, and are quite optimistic that, that we uh, that we manage, um, but also to look at what doesn't work then in, in this context, certainly, um, and, and have a constant dialogue and constant <coughs> feedback, you know, from the players involved, really. So what are, what are the, the obstacles and where do we see, you know, um, yeah, problem to, to grow in the area? And then finally, I mean, we always come back to, to the same topic there. We need still a truly digital single market. I mean, that you see this this huge growth and p further potential in North America and China because they can tap into a huge market, right? So we are still not fully there and, and, and need to foster that. Um, and yeah, I mean, the Commission is still busy um, implementing that. But it's, yeah, that's the, <coughs> it seems the eternal problem that we still need to solve. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna, move away from this competitiveness side now and come back to the point about um, tech neutral rules because as I said I think this gets to the, the sort of the most important elements of the GDPR that, that, that we think are troublesome um, and I'm, I'm going to go to uh, to Uke first um, there are it's, it's not yet clear whether the GDPR actually says you have a right to have each decision explained to you. And even, even the Article 29 Working Party guidelines on this are not that clear. But whether they do or not, this, clearly there's this right there to at least have a human review of the algorithm, which implies there needs to be some level of interpretability is, is required in the law. Even if it's not necessary interpretability to the customer, um, it's clear that the algorithm has to be interpretable. Um, and, and as I say, it applies to a very broad range of decisions. Legal or similarly significant <coughs> is, is a lot of things. Um, so my question is, what's the best way to manage the, the trade-off between and having an algorithm that gives you a decision that is accurate and reliable, um, accurate in a statistical sense, I mean, and having a decision that you can explain because this the, the, the tension between these two goals, if I'm right. Well, you, you answer your question yourself. You know, I, uh, and, uh, the explainability, the readability, whatever intelligibility of algorithms has always been a very strong issue in AI since the 50s. Even, you know, but, you know, when an algorithm is taking a decision, you need to understand, you know, how he reached that, that decision. And that has always been a very kind of ambiguous notion. And that concern only the machine learning area, because the non-machine learning one, you know, the things like reasoning, problem solving, uh, you know, like your GPS, you know, it can easily explain you why, you know, it, it makes this direction for you, because there is an algorithm, which is called, for instance, A-star, which is one of the famous algorithms in there, and you can easily explain it, and I can tell you, and the, even the algorithm could trace back his reasoning and, and, and tell you why it took that decision. So no deal with the non-machine learning AI. The machine learning AI raise a, a, a kind of more, more difficult uh, problem, you know, because, let's say, machine learning plus big data is coupled. Because most of the, you know, most of the justification will be based on statistics. You know, for instance, you know, if, I, if, if machine learning AI tells you, you about, you know, that developing a cancer, and if you uh, uh, ask a deep learning machine why why is it so, you know, the deep learning machine will tell you because there's eighty percent. How you know whenever we do machine learning in AI, you do something like called cross validation. It's kind of statistical testing, and and eighty percent, you know, we have a certainty and eighty percent certainty. So we prefer to tell you that you are bad because eighty percent of chance of uh, you know, developing a cancer. And if you and if you tell the, the algorithms why 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 this eighty percent, you know. And uh, it, it can't really tell you, you know, it will tell you because 80% of the people that were a little bit like you developed a cancer, which is just a statistical justification. Let's say that in most of the medical world, it's always a, this level of justification. You know, most of the medicine is, 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 you know, is doing the same thing. They cannot explain you exactly why is your genes uh, influence with your proteins, which influence with somewhere. So you never have this level of explanation even in the medical world. So I mean that in that case, I believe that it's fair enough. You know, you can't do better than that. Even if 
this machine learning algorithm is processing a lot of variables, perhaps thousands of variables. It can't explain you better than that, you know, 80%. Right? Just to, and is that enough? You know, is that enough for the GDPR type of legislation? Uh, I don't know. I really don't know. But I'm pretty sure that if you take this deep learning machine, they have millions of parameters. And, uh, you know, this multi-layer things, you know, and they process thousands of variables, millions of parameters, database with millions of patients. Uh, we'll never be able to reach a better, you know, a better explanation of that. I'm going to come straight back on this, because it, it seems as though whatever we might, we might think of the way the rules have been written, the reason that that's pretty obvious in that there is an ethical concern about um, <clears throat> algorithms that, you know, making decisions and the companies that control these algorithms not being held accountable. And the idea is, is that if, if, you're, if you're made to explain the decision or if, or if you're at least meant to have a human review the decision, there can be a check on sort of, you know, a machine that might be for whatever reason, biased or making a decision that's unfair. Um, where does in in in, in uh, where do, where does bias come from? If it exists at all in algorithms, I mean, what? Because obviously, algorithms are not conscious. They don't have they don't have bad days. They don't have um, prejudices. They don't have you know emotional hang-ups about different sectors of the population, whereas humans do, and often don't realise that they do. Um, <coughs> So, what, what, I mean, is it? Well, I suppose, is there any basis for concern in that sense in, in, in algorithmic bias? And if there is, where does it come from? But that, sorry, that's for Hugh. Ah, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. Oh. Well, the bias in algorithms is two ways to explain it. You you can have wrong data, you know. So, for instance, obviously, if your data, if you have a non-cancer person that you know and you put in the data that they developed the cancer whatever this is kind of a wrong data and so so you can have wrong decision because you, your business is in the wrong data but even in the case where you have perfect data about the reality you still have a bias for algorithm which is called uh, in, in machine learning terms it's called overfitting and, and that is a concern you know overfitting means that you extrapolate too much with respect to what you have in your data and uh, so you take the past as the best indicator of the future. And, and, and that is, you know, it's a problem for machine learning itself, you know, overfitting is something we try to avoid. But we, there was a very interesting book on, uh, I don't remember the name of the author on, uh, you know, algorithms, uh, weapon of mass destruction. Uh, there's been a very popular book in the United States telling that because of this overfitting just, uh, we might, uh, you know, bias a lot of the decision and for instance, send police uh, in districts where we know that they are very unsafe district, but we keep sending police where we didn't need an algorithm like that, but we make it even unsafer because we send police only in that district, etc. So there's, we, there can be, you know, kind of decisions which are too much, you know, we, you just reinforce the evidence, you know, this is kind of overfeeding. And overfeeding is a very bad thing, you know. And uh, we have to avoid overfeeding, and this is the only bias that I can imagine for machine learning algorithms these days. So you have to retrain with new data whenever you have something which is, you know, contradictory. You have a situation which is in contradiction with the decision taken by your algorithm. This is new data. You, you have to retrain your algorithms in order to avoid this overfeeding. This is the only bias that I know in, in machine learning is overfeeding. I don't, I don't see of any other. So now I think that sounds like, like those of those who have taken who are not computer scientists but have taken statistics classes, that would be kind of the black swan problem that you know, if you've only ever seen white swans, you wouldn't expect, you know, statistically ever expect to see a black swan. That's right. Um, yeah, this is called the inductive bias, you know, you, 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 the data, you think the data are telling you all the truth, and it's pretty true that, you know, if the truth is in the data, but you have to induce a generalization decision capacity out of the data. So if you stick too much on the data, sometimes you can be misled, you know. Um, and, and, and besides that, the, then the, the source of bias is, is bad data, and obviously as the center for data innovation, we advocate good data, but um, no, that, I mean, that, 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 that's interesting. Um, and so what, what also interests me is the fact that these attempts to try, quite you know, understandable attempts to um, address ethical concerns about bias and unfairness only really think about potential bias in algorithms. When I, when I say, it seems to me that it's, it's humans that, that are most susceptible to the most uh, damaging and dangerous, you know, damaging dangerous kinds of bias, but also the most difficult to explain. I mean, um, I don't even know 
why I do the things I do. I don't know, I don't know how I could explain it to anybody else. I mean, if I do explain it to anybody else, <laughs> um, you know, how, can, how can you trust what I, what I say about why I do things? Um, I hope you all take my point that um, the, the real, I mean, the term that's sometimes used in, in AI um, is that you know, algorithms are black boxes. Well, humans are, are black boxes, and they can tell you why they do things. But even if they think they're telling the truth, that it doesn't necessarily mean that they are. Um, and this is where I'm, I'm going to come to Richard next, because see, you're working in financial markets where decisions, quite significant decisions about people, get made all the time, such as you know your credit rating, whether to give you a loan, uh, whether to give you insurance, how much to charge you for insurance, um, and. Um, until now, these decisions have been made certainly with models, but not necessarily with AI. And often there is there is a human who makes the call. Um, what rights do people have already um, for decisions like that made about them? So if I get refused a loan, for example, what, what rights do I already have? If you forget about AI for a minute, because this takes me on to my next question where I'm going with this. Well, I think under the principles of the directive, I think you know a data subject would be within their rights to go in and, and question the um, bank or insurance company as to as to the basis of their decision. Um, I think the GDPR kind of only only strengthens that. Um, I think I think the argument from the financial services side is that in order, and it goes back to your point about human bias. Uh, it's partly to do with the volume of the applications for things like loans, but it's also about having sort of consistent decisions and fair decisions, um, and having some kind of um, model or automation to it, in a, either standalone or in addition to humans, is likely to give you a fairer and more consistent outcome. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say any any system is going to be perfect, um, but I think that's that's sort of the justification. Um, and I think the, you know, the working party guidelines on automated, automated decision making, profiling, sort of flag uh, the granting of a loan or not, or the process for doing that um, in one of their little boxes, you know, the, to distinguish between situation which is, which is a decision based on profiling, and a decision which is solely based on automated decision making. So I think it's clearly recognised by data protection authorities that, that that banks, you know, that is a, a fairly standard practice within mm. banks, and I. Don't represent the insurance companies, but I imagine they have similar, similar sorts of um, processes. So the reason I ask this is, it, is it seems to me that, um, and actually, the original draft of the Working Party guidelines didn't talk about lending; they talked about advertising. Um, they, they suggested that I think it was online casinos, an advert, an automated advert for online casino could have legal some significant effects. I'm thinking, well. <coughs> There's a claim that needs testing, um, but it, it didn't make it into the final cut of the guidelines. But what, what I was getting at is it seems to me that it, as long as this right to meaningful information, whatever that means, um, as long as that applies to algorithmic decisions, there seem to be many situations within this umbrella of legal or similarly significant where you have to give the data subject certain information if um, you're using an algorithm, but if a human makes the call, you don't have to do that. Which, from an as long as we're sticking with ethics, to me seems odd. If it's if you if you I mean even if you assume that the humans and algorithms are equally prone to bias, and I don't think they are. I think humans are more prone to bias, but definitely. yeah, definitely. Um, that it seems odd that we we're, we're holding algorithms to a higher standard. I think that's what I was getting. At. I mean, and I think what you're saying is, is that in, in, in financial services, the the rules have kind of been there already. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think, I mean, under GDPR, obviously we've got now the principles of transparency, accountability, etc., much more strengthened from the directive. So I take your point that there's, you know, there's an explicit um, wording in in Article Twenty Two about human intervention in the case of solely automated decision making, but I think, um, okay, that, that isn't there for uh, a decision that's not solely based on automated decision making, but I think, I think under accountability transparency, there will be some obligation 
uh, to explain uh, the basis of decisions anyway. And yes, please do. Yeah, maybe, maybe some insights on how you know a company deals deals with that. Um, first of all, um, we we think that uh, what is now Article Twenty Two used to be Article Twenty. Um, yes, insists on having um, human decision involved when it has this could have this this critical impact, and it's. I mean, it's just a reflection of how society works here, and and um, you can you can argue with that. But um, I have to say that when I look at our internal structures, and especially also in research, you know, when you when you come to research, we have um, measures in place based on a risk-based approach. That when when uh, we see things going on, you know, in, in, in the technology, that we have a human individual flagging it. And this is the way how our structures are set up. We don't we don't have a structure where just technology from A to to Z takes the decision. So um, yeah, the question is do you do you wanna, you know, leave that all behind? Because you know, you could argue that yes, algorithms are more accurate in the end. And and I mean we all know um, looking at, at different cases that apparently uh, when it comes to judges that um, they're more prone to and I don't know which way it is, if they they're more prone to um, convicting somebody prior to lunch or afterwards or <clears throat> there seems to be a pattern. So you, you see after lunch. After lunch. Okay. <laughs> okay. There was there was some pattern. So we I mean now you know you that you can analyze all these cases. You see you see patterns where uh, certainly there, there is human failure and there is there is some bias, absolutely. But still when it comes to very critical um, decisions at the end of the day, and again, you know, looking at a risk based structure uh, where you where you then all of a sudden realize that there might be a risk. Wouldn't you want to have a human being involved? And shouldn't shouldn't the human being at the end of the day be really at the end of the process and take the final decision? I think that's a societal debate we need to have, you know, but I wouldn't just throw it out of the window to be honest, even if, if algorithms can can be more accurate at the end of the day. Well, yeah, said, we, we don't necessarily suggest throwing all this out of the window. Um, we're actually our next report um, We'll, we'll be on this question of bias in, in algorithms and we'll, we'll look at ways of managing the ethics there. Um, and with regards to the, the, the societal debate, I mean, we already have the law now. Um, so I, mean, I think it was... The, a cynic might say it's too late to have the debate, but what, what I was going to... I'm going to come straight back to Karina, because this is about how these <coughs> things play out in a company. Um, as I say, the, the Article 29 Working Party guidelines on um, explainability are not, they're not crystal clear, but they broadly seem to say that you do not have to explain every individual decision and you don't have to expose, well they're quite clear in saying you don't have to expose your algorithm actually. They're, they're not so clear in, in saying when you have to explain individual decisions. They say you don't always have to do that. Um, the corollary of that implying sometimes you do, um, but they say that in, they give the I think in the financial services example they they say well you could say this is the information we use to make our decision and our algorithm prioritizes this which is as I say is kind of how things have been in finance already, but there does seem to be sufficient room for interpretation um, in the GDPR and, and particularly if you take the recitals into account which in corporate you can. Um, to say that there's a, a broader right in there. And remember, this is how the right to be forgotten came into existence. It was, it was a court case based on a particular interpretation of the Data Protection Directive, or, or of this, you know, the, the Spanish <laughs> version of the Data Protection Directive. Um, so could there be a, a situation where a company is pushed to give an intelligible and detailed explanation for individual decisions um, that that question's for Karina, so I'm going to go to her first. But I know I saw Hooks got hand right. go, so I will come to you afterwards. But I'll go to Karina first. Um, I mean, we would we would expect that there is now with the GDPR that there will be 
many more data subjects who will um, require and will demand um, you know, access to their data and understand what, what kind of data is being processed about them. Um, the, to what level of detail you really have to go, that's, that's you know, for us still uh, uh, an issue to be debated. Also, um, sometimes the question, you know, when you, when you have an, um, you could imagine an employee who says, I want to have access to all the emails that, uh, where my name, you know, was, was flagged or somebody had a debate about me, you know. Um, and then you immediately get into the, the, the problem, um, what about you know, the data of other people? So I think there, there are a lot of question marks still, still out there. So um, this is also why, why I would say, you know, for me, the law is not written in stone. I think there is a lot, lot of um, discussion and debate we still need to have about how do we really shape these rights. And you could, you could imagine that, um, if you really want to go after a particular company, you could, you know, um, related to this debate about class action, you could imagine like <clears throat> hundreds of people asking uh, access at the same time, and then you can be sure that probably you can't cater to that, you know, because I think the time frame is something you need to respond like in six weeks or so. So you could, um, yeah, there are a lot of unknowns out there, but as, as such, I wouldn't say that. The, the rights which are enshrined there are, you know, that it's not possible to cater to them. It's just really the question of how this is then going to be, you know, enforced and and um, also, yeah, you know, again related to class actions. What are what are people going to do? I'm going to come back to that point later because it's, it's maybe think of something else. But you, you yeah, well, I wanted just to add, add something in, in, in the computer science uh, environment and even in scientific environment in general now. <laughs> there is an important trend which is taking place for these last 10 years, and this trend is called GitHub. And you certainly heard about that. And, and I believe that this is the way everything should proceed today in this algorithmic world. You know, we ask for transparency, we ask for understandability in algorithms. Look at GitHub. GitHub is a fantastic thing, you know. All my researchers today, but not only in computer science, even in physics or in chemistry, in biology, they publish their algorithms on GitHub. You know that there is one billion of code signs right now in GitHub. And a million of computer scientists know every day publish their work on GitHub. And, and that is fully transparent because you have the source code of the algorithm. So you should not only publish the code, but you also should publish the data. So both of them. And I, and I, and I really believe that you know, because the algorithm is more and more taking the control of our life, you know, every day you use algorithms for, you know, helping you taking decisions. We more and more entrust our lives to algorithms. And I believe that those, all those algorithms, even the search engine of Google, even the, you know, the, the GPS of Waze, any kind of algorithm should be published in the way of GitHub, because as you know, computer scientists have always shown the way. You know, we do the algorithms. We would like to see this algorithm <coughs> treated in a certain way. So I really believe that this is a trend, and I, I you know, I, I always uh, refer to this uh, very nice algorithm in France, but which is highly debated these days on access to the university. You know, this uh, uh, it was called admission post back first. No, it's called parcours sup, and it raised a lot of issues. And this algorithm was totally opaque. Most of the people, most of the students, you know, their life depend on this algorithm because the university they're going to follow is decided by the algorithms. And people were really complaining about that because there was a lot of random selection in these algorithms before. People wanted to make it transparent. And now what the French uh, company has decided is to put more and more on those algorithms in GitHub, even the parcours sub, or uh, there is another one called Open Fisca. So the fiscality, you know, the taxation is more and more transparent and put on GitHub. I'd like to see tax on web, you Belgium. I'd like to see tax on web put on GitHub, you know. Everyone can see it, play with it, rule it. So this is a society I'm dreaming of. It's not yet done, but this is really a dream. I definitely agree that the tax on web software needs an update. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I, first I want to welcome Victoria to the panel. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that the, the taxi strike got in your way. Um, uh, oh, I, I, I do have some, some questions here, and, and we've still got time for them before we open up to the audience. But I wanted to come back to Karina, because the point you raised about class action lawsuits, and I mean, you were talking about with explainability and transparency, <coughs> but this is also something I was thinking about with the right to erasure. Um, because and there's, there's quite a bit of academic literature on 
the effect of, of, of a right to erasure on algorithms. Um, and it's interesting because what the evidence seems to say is that if any one person decides to erase the data, the probability of it having a negative impact on an algorithm is very small. But the more people do it, and, and it's very hard to say at what point it's going to it's going to start, you know, that it could break an algorithm and stop it working for other people. In other words, because it doesn't just depend on how many data subjects do this; it also depends on exactly how important are those data subjects in the model. Um, I'm just trying to think of how would a company cope with a scenario where you had a large class action suit of people saying we want to remove our data. Bearing in mind this is kind of happening. Now, some people are calling for this in response to the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, what, what would this mean for algorithms? Um, I'll go to Karina first, just because you raised this class action point, but I know that uh, Hugh and Richard uh, can see you've got point things to say in this as well. Um, again, we are, we are a B2B company, so often we are, uh, we are processing data on behalf of our customers, and they would then be the first in line for this kind of, you know, class action, whatever. Um, just to clarify, my, my point was on the class action was first of all to to say that um, there there is a lot in the law where we don't think it's it's a barrier as such per se. It really depends on how then it's being implemented and enforced, right? So. Um, so there, there are obviously rules and rights in there which, which are totally legitimate and which we support, but it, it really then depends on might there even be abuse for that, you know, and we would, I think as a company, we would also be ready to flag that, you know, with our local data protection authority to say, um, we, we don't argue with the underlying right or the principle, but we have this <coughs> and that kind of experience, which we think is really, as such, maybe might might be for, you know, this this might be an, an action which was launched for totally different reasons, mm -hmm. right? So, so um, again, you know, coming back to my point on a dialogue, we need a constant dialogue, and we need to have. You know, not a fully fledged whistleblowing system, but we need to also, as, as as stakeholders, have the possibility to feed something back into the system without totally, you know, exposing maybe the, the the case. So, but you know, we I I would anticipate that these these cases are going to arise. You know, that you will have, you know, not not a formal class action, but maybe like I don't know, three hundred people at the same time who who ask for for access, but. You don't know what the underlying reason is, you know. And so it could be some sort of, yeah, denial of service attack in a wider, in a wider yeah. sense, if you will. And again, you know, um, I, I think there should be a system in place to to have a, a you know, a safe environment to have this 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 debate about about that. Um, so I mean, but it hasn't, you know, uh, we haven't been confronted with it directly, but obviously we're discussing it internally. But again, you know, for us, it's always, um, it it often concerns our customer data. So we would never ever take any decision on on these matters without involving the customer, who's the data controller in most of the cases. Mm. Uh, you, 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 that point? No. Okay. <coughs> uh, I, 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 you seem to want to say something on a what? On erasure. Deletion. Oh uh, yeah. Well it's it's um well, you know, I'm I'm doing a lot of you know, uh, data processing for again I'm you know obsessed with by cancer because I'm doing a lot of research on data processing for cancer. And 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 uh, and uh, with GDPR, well, in all universities now is raising a lot of issue of what you can do, what you can't do, and uh, for many for the last ten years, you know, the the only way we you know, we processed this legislation was to obtain the consent of the uh, of the patients. You know, for cancer or for we have also uh, an application in my lab where we try to spy the consumption, the energy code consumption of people. We put sensors in the house, and uh, we we spend a lot of time writing. The, you know, establishing the right consent and uh, <laughs> and I and I believe that at the end, uh, you know, when people know exactly what what the algorithms are aiming at, you know, and uh, they certainly agree, most of them, because in general you use the data of the others to, you know, to improve your life, you know, because this is obviously what happened with, take for instance Waze, I love Waze for that, you know, even if it's an American thing and I'd like to have the European Waze, but anyway, uh, the fact that you, you take the data of others, you know, to improve your circulation, etc. So this is basically the idea of, you know, this data, big data in general, in theory, you know, in, in an ideal world, 
use the data of other people in a perhaps anonymous way, but even not so much anonymous because you need to have a lot of information about those people in order to help you, you know, from cancer, for instance, if you make a, a diagnosis of cancer, you need to know a lot about the other people, you know, you need to know their age, perhaps not their name, but at least a lot of them. And it has been shown by people in UCL that when you, when, when you have two, two or three information about the people, even if you don't have their name, it's really easy to get back their name, you know. So, I mean, this anonymization business is a very tricky thing, you know. And I, I'm, I'm less and less concerned by anonymization, but, but really by the usage you do with the data, you know. If that provides good for the people, you know, why shouldn't, why shouldn't they accept? So, I know it's, it's a very difficult debate, but we try with the concept, we really explain what we're going to do with the other data to the people. Now, for reasure, it is pretty clear that, you know, it's a bad thing, you know, because a neural network just works with data. If you erase the data, it's, 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 it's gone, you know, you don't have any decision capability. So, so raising data uh, will make uh, a lot of problems, you know, and uh, you know, retrain is, in general, when we retrain our learning machines with new data, not losing data, so, you know, so getting rid of data, it's, it's because you have to backtrack in the past and see all decisions you've been taken, which are based on data that now you erase, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Nick, yeah, can I just make it? You guys had an interesting point there. If your if your patients then are happy, they give consent, yeah. um, and they they know that there's going to be some complicated model, which will then uh, hopefully help their help their health. Um, in that case, does it follow that they don't see any risk to their sort of rights and freedoms? Um, and so, just going back to your point about the need to explain the algorithms. If, if, if the data subjects there are not seeing a problem, then would that not suggest that um, the explanation that Hugh and others are giving to the patients is, is, is good enough? And so if that's true, would there really be a trade-off between, if you like, better and better models and the GDPR question? Mm. I mean, I think the, um, the, the tricky thing with the, the transparency rules in the GDPR is, is that the, in terms of the decisions they apply to, they're so non-specific. I mean, I think it's it's in, in in a situation like the health example that Luke describes, you can get to a point where you can say this kind of explanation would be good enough, um, but that's not necessarily going to apply in all cases, um, which is why you know, until now, for most different kinds of decisions, you know, we have a different. You have a right to certain kinds of information when you get refused a loan. You have a right to quite, you know, quite a lot more information if you get arrested, um, or if you get charged. I mean, it's it's because these are clearly fundamentally different kinds of actions that affect you in very different ways, and and you know, the information that's given you has to be appropriate to what's being done to you effectively, which is which is also it comes brings us back to this idea. of of, of, of tech neutral policy. I don't want to call it tech neutrality because it just sounds too much like net neutrality. I don't want to create another loaded term, but I mean laws that you know that operate on the basis of the ethics of the situation in question rather than simply on the technology. Um, I, before we open up to questions from the audience, I wanted to um, just give Victoria uh, an opportunity to respond to some of the questions that I came with with her in mind. Um, so obviously you're, you're on the AI task force at, at FTI Consulting, so you work with a lot of different companies that are using or producing AI. Um, so my question for you, because I, I just imagine that position gives you a kind of an overview of, of the market, and I opened this discussion by quoting, uh, I hope he doesn't mind me quoting him, I, I actually did invite him to the panel, but he wasn't available today. I, I, I opened by, by quoting Christopher Kuhner uh, at the UB, who says that the GDPR is the most complicated piece of regulation that EU has ever adopted. And as I say, I'm, I'm cautious of superlatives, but I can see why he would say that. So, first I'm saying, do you agree with him? But secondly, and I don't expect you to name any clients, by the way, <laughs> in this next answer, um, do you think that AI companies are prepared when I say prepared, I don't mean willing. I mean, do you think they, they know what's coming? Do you think they're ready to comply in a, in a practical sense? <coughs> so first of all, excuse me for coming late. I got really stuck, I think, like maybe one hour, in one hour, 100 meters. Um, so I apologize for that. And I realized when I was stuck in my car, 
how much those taxi drivers were not ready for change. And I think, I think it's more or less the same here. Um, are companies ready for change? Are um, big AI companies? Yeah, for sure. Uh, the bigger ones, the CAFA, the Netflix, they are ready. But if you're looking at AI companies, it's mainly startups, little companies that have no clue what's happening uh, at member state levels or either at EU level. Uh, so do they know what's coming? I've got some doubts there. Um, after regarding um, your questions about is it the most complicated regulation, um, I think there has been similar uh, complex uh, regulation in other sectors. After GDPR, uh, maybe with an exception for roaming, is the only legislation uh, where my friends from the Brussels Belgium bubble, nothing to do with the EU bubble, told me what's, what's that GDPR? Um, and, and they've heard about it. I don't think anyone cares about platform legislation or P2B uh, when you're a real citizen. But GDPR, they know about it. After, they just know it's about data protection. And I think it's really important for them to understand what GDPR means, which right they will have, uh, what's the limits. Um, because this weekend I was watching the news and um, they were interviewing a guy saying, well, what do you think about Facebook uh, and Cambridge Analytics? And you say, oh, I might switch my um, Facebook account off. But that does not mean that Facebook will delete the data. So I think there is, there is also room for uh, improvement in terms of understanding uh, legislation uh, from the citizens. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's gets to a problem with, it, with EU regulation generally is that awareness among citizens tends to be quite low. And the GDPR, I think, is, is coming much higher up the agenda now, partly thanks to the press uh, talking about it much more than they do normally EU regulations. Um, although, I mean, I mentioned net neutrality before. I mean, it seems to me that, that kind of most of the people that I talk to outside of the Brussels bubble know more about American net neutrality regulations or, or what was American net neutrality regulations than they do about the EU rules on this. Um, just because I think John Oliver is probably the, the person to either thank or blame for that. Um, but um, I think we've got about 25 minutes left. I'm going to open up the questions from the audience because we've got a full house and I can see one hand up there already. Um, when you ask a question, just so we can see you, can you please stand up and tell us your name and um, if you're joining us from any particular organisation, please tell us which one. Uh, the gentleman with the glasses. Thank you. Craig Nicholson, I'm a journalist with Research Europe. Craig Nicholson, you're a journalist from Research Europe. I hope you don't mind if I, if I repeat what you say, no, it's just because no. you haven't got a microphone and we don't have a roving mic. Um, so you started by listing a big bunch of problems with the GDPR, and I just wondered, are we now in the point where, I'm asking what can we do about it? So are we just warning those companies that are unaware of the problems, and that's what we can do? Or can we actually try and mitigate those problems somehow, like through lobbying or you know the debates that you mentioned? Mm -hmm. So what can we do, the question was, what, what can we do about the GDPR now that we have it? Is, is that a fair phrase of, of yeah. your question? Good. We have to go first. Um, so I am I think it doesn't help to, first of all, argue with the underlying principles. I mean, our position and that also of many other companies was that the, 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 the principles to, for the protection um, and, and let's always you know, keep in mind that it's not about protecting the data, it's about protecting the individual behind the data. That the principles were sound in the 9546, mm -hmm. and they still are, and they are in the GDPR. And I, I think, to be honest, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be arguing with, with, the, with the protection as, as such. But um, it's true that it's a complex piece of legislation, and there's still a lot of room for interpretation. And, and, you know, I keep on repeating myself, but I think when we, when we, when we see major, major stumbling blocks, you know, where we, where, we, where we know the reason for, you know, having, for example, the, the, the principle of purpose limitation, I think everybody understands that why, you know, you've, you've, you've um, uh, collected the data for, for uh, a certain purpose, and especially if it's based on consent, you know, um, it's, it uh, just makes a lot of sense that the, the person who, whose data is then being processed for, for a different uh, purpose is, well, either you find a different legal ground or the person knows about it and, <clears throat> and you get a different uh, consent for it. I think it makes a lot of sense. But if, if we would run, and we haven't seen this now, right, but if, 
because we were especially also discussing the, the patient scenario, and, and as you said, um, you should be able to be transparent about it and explain it to the person. Um, so have, have we already encountered a major stumbling block? And I wouldn't say we, we haven't, but it, you know, it, could, it could still happen. And this is, this is why I keep on coming back of having this, this dialogue and being able to feed it back into the system if there's something you know, we haven't considered before, where we, where we think this is um, the reason for the protection lies here, <laughs> but uh, we, might, we might encounter major, major obstacles. And how can we mitigate that? And I think it's all, you know, we will, we will see this going forward, especially also how we <coughs> have a chance to interact with the European Data Protection Board. That's going to be very interesting. I think um, from, a, from, from our experience, um, we, we don't see a problem with having a good interaction with your uh, data protection authority. I mean, I can only recommend that to to you know make sure that th there is a dialogue in, in place. I know it's 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 much more complicated for the smaller companies, um, but just have a constant dialogue and and yeah. But at the European level, we have to see how this is going to evolve. Huh? But um, due to the complexity, also uh, you know uh, a body like the European Data Protection Board is is very busy with itself to, to set up the structures and everything, but we are looking forward to having having a, a dialogue with them, which we think is really crucial. Just to build on uh, what Karina said, I think moving forward, uh, GDPR will be reviewed in the future, um, but also looking at more broadly artificial intelligence legislation. So now the Commission is thinking about doing guidelines or big principles about ethics, but more liability question, etc. But Muda said uh, last week um, at the Artificial Intelligence Summit that it was more and more needed to have more cooperation between the industry and um, the decision makers. And I think that's very important because they have to better understand how the real world is working. And for the moment, I'm not sure they really get it. Um, so to have efficient flow and to make it happen and to be constructive and to allow competitiveness and you're up to lead, I think more cooperation, uh, working together is really essential. Um, I'm sorry if I don't go across all panelists for this because I, I don't want to spend too much time and I can see there are more questions. Well, one of the points I wanted to make was in, in the report we do argue that the GDPR needs to be reviewed and needs to be amended. Um, the report was published yesterday and I, 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 don't, I, I, I don't actually pay that much attention to what goes on on Twitter. I mean, I don't, you, you'll notice if you look at my Twitter feed I don't really tweet that much. but. I, I did look at some of the reactions we got to the report, and one, one of the first criticisms that I saw was cynicism at this claim that we, this argument that we made that the GDPR needs to be amended. It was, it was, and 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 I completely understand why people are cynical of that because how long does it take for the EU to pass regulation? How long does it take to amend regulation in the EU? I mean, it's probably going to be a very long time before the GDPR gets amended. Though we argue that that's the only way to solve the problem. Um, but it's interesting that in, 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 in any other legislative context, the argument that you need to amend this piece of legislation would be the first argument. I mean, I think it's, it's partly that once we have these regulations and they get set in stone for so long, it's part of the problem. Um, it's that we, can, we create rules for ourselves that we're going to remain with for a very long time, and, and there isn't this kind of, um, you know, I, I don't want to start using kind of, you know, buzzwords about, you know, agility or whatever, um, but you know what I mean, that there's, there's no kind of, e even even in, in, in fairly traditional legislative systems, there is, there is you, you perhaps, you wouldn't call it an agile process, but there's an iterative process in the law. Um, I saw a, another hand up here, yes. Uh, Andre Pirlet from a small uh, company APR, so I might have the solution. In the past, there were difficulties with uh, some uh, legislation, some directives, and the Commission uh, set up a more or less informal uh, discussion club in order to uh, prepare interpretative uh, documents. So they had no real legal value, but nevertheless they were used, for example, by notified bodies uh, for the gas appliance directive, and uh, we might use uh, the same uh, methodology here, 
in order to prepare <coughs> these interpretative uh, documents with limited participation just for one representative for each European Federation. So this is done at uh, the EU level with uh, the, the board for data protection, but also the Commission. All the discussions must be led by the Commission in an informal way. Mm -hmm. And so you have, you ask for agility. So you have that agility because it uh, would be a, a committee who would meet uh, regularly, and so you will see the improvement in the interpretation of the legislation, and this would be an excellent way of preparing the amendments of the regulation. So, uh, and this would correspond more or less also with the wishes of the industry, because of course the industry would be represented in such a group. So you, you said your name was Pierre and you, you're from a small company, yeah. Pierre Pilet. And your suggestion was that um, that, they should, that something the Commission has done in the past is, is to set up consultative groups to look at what's going well or going badly or all in order to inform future amendments. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if that was it. Um, okay, are there any questions? Yes. I'm Shane Meischleck and I'm a master's student from KU Leuven, IP and ICT law. And my question was, like Ms. Schluss stated that, uh, purpose limitation is quite important, but uh, is it possible to limit the purpose when it comes to big data and especially machine learning AI? Okay. So, um, I, I mean, I mean you're, you're closer to the camera than I am, so the camera probably heard you, but just in case okay. everyone... So you're assuming from KU Leuven and, and your question is, uh, is it possible to limit, to do purpose limitation when you're using big data? And the question was for Karina, right? Yeah, and maybe um, for technical part, like uh, machine learning AI, can you limit the purpose in general? Maybe. Thank you. Well, so, I mean, if you, if you have collected personal data in a certain context for a certain purpose, then you were within these boundaries, you know, uh, supposed to use it for, for that purpose. If you want to use it in a totally different context for a totally different purpose, you need to get a new legal basis for that. And that might require to go back and ask an individual for consent. Um, having said that, and you will, you will come to the technical, the additional technical uh, measures that you can take if you're if you're able to anonymize the data, and it's a totally different story because as we heard, um, then you're out of the scope of, of, of the GDPR. So um, that that is certainly an area where you um, where you need to look at what is you know what is possible and what is um, the best decision to, to take in that context. But yes, I mean this is essentially purpose limitation is. Is stating exactly that it was it was collected for a certain purpose and it's so you know supposed to be only used in, in uh, within these these boundaries. Now, I mean, this is obviously the the example um, where you can say that this is this is a big, big obstacle. But on the other hand, um, um, one should look at the solutions that are out there. And I'm going to hand it over to you too. No, I fully agree with what you say. I would just go back to, I think there would be a fundamental point to be uh, resolved to some extent as to what level of statistical justification is fair enough. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you another example, which is what happened with Uber just last week. You know, they crushed someone, they killed someone. And, and uh, the autonomous Uber car. And uh, people are complaining, you know, how, how is that possible, etc. There's a, a very easy way for defending autonomous cars is a statistical justification. If you go back, you know, from they running in our cities for two years now, and if you compile the statistics, you'll see that they make much less victims than <coughs> any car dri driven by human. But it seems that it's not enough, you know, people want to understand why someone has been killed by, by an autonomous car. So we realize that in certain in domain, like perhaps the law, the, the weapon, you, you, you would like to have more than just a statistical justification. But for me, I think it's too much. You know, we're telling you that we're, we're demanding for algorithms something that we never demanded for human beings. And I think that this is really what happened with statistical justification. According to me, the statistical justification is, is, is should, should be fair enough, you know. Even in law, you know, you were saying that perhaps lawyers or someone that has been condemned 
uh, <coughs> or tried by, you know, and, and if we tell him, you know, well, statistically, you know, you are, it's normal that we punished you because 80% of the people who behave like you was punished, etc. You might say, no, this is not enough as a justification, but is it really true, you know? I mean, uh, I mean, you, we can be fair, you know, we, we can go back to the past and realize that statistically, with an algorithm, there's been less mistake than with a human lawyer, which is exactly the story of a before lunch, after lunch type of decision. You know, an algorithm would never statistically made this kind of mistakes. So according to me, we should be clear on that, you know, this machine learning type of AI, not the non-machine learning one. But the machine learning, more and more, they rely on statistics. So I believe that this should be large enough. I think the, the other point in the criminal justice example is you know, we, we've only really been learning in recent years of the number of cases that have been settled on DNA evidence that's later been debunked. Mm -hmm. And in some of these cases, the, the defendants have been executed. And it's, 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 a, it's a real problem. Um, and you know, I, I can see why you know, the, 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 this idea that the human judgment has been, has, 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 has been such a safeguard so far is, is, is a... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange um, claim, but also the point on anonymization, I mean, um, so, something we, we, we point to in the report with regard um, to the right to erasure is that if the rules on anonymization could be clearer, that could actually fix uh, quite a few problems, and it would certainly ease to, to a degree the limits on, on purpose limitation. I mean, the problem is at the moment is it's quite hard to say this data is anonymized yeah. because even though I mean anonymization works, but um, the, the the problem is you, I mean you have to it, it's the, the the rules are based on the likelihood of it being re-anonymized. So it's a claim about what happens in the future. So if if, if it does somehow get re-anonymized in the future, then what you did in the past becomes illegal. Um, we, we, <laughs> Which which is which is complicated. I mean, if, if if there could be clearer standards on on when you can say you've anonymized data, some of these problems might um, be eased a bit because you could anonymize the data and then reclips it. Um, yes, a question here. The, um, I'll I'll take you first, and then I'll come to you next. Yes, um, my name is Hedvig Josefsson, and I'm an associate for the Swedish law firm Vinge. And um, kind of on the point what we were just talking about here, I was wondering, or maybe perhaps <coughs> just an observation on the question around bias and why you would want to know exactly how a decision was made by an algorithm, I think perhaps it comes back to the chance to impact a decision. So if I'm convicted by an algorithm for something I did, normally if, if there's a human judge, I could perhaps at least feel that I have more a way of impacting that person's decision making. or. I could appeal, or perhaps in the longer run, I could become a judge myself to so make sure that some other person would not get convicted, and so on. And what could be a solution to that? Is it just to, um, I don't know, add the right bias in an algorithm, or would there still be always a need for a person for that type of problematics? Can I start with the policy analyst's answer, and then I want to move to Uk for a scientific point that we get to, but. And first of all, you, I mean, there are there are there are no algorithmic judges. I mean, to, to, to be a judge, you, no. one, one of the criteria is you, is you have to be human. And I think this is you know, when when people talk about Minority Report, for example, it's, it's you, you, you don't need legislation to stop Minority Report happening. You would need legislation to make Minority Report happen. You would have to have something saying, oh, well, if an algorithm predicts you're going to commit a crime, we can convict you of it beforehand. Um, and, and also, I mean, it, it obviously depends on, on the jurisdiction in the EU, but you know, whether you've got the kind of, you know, so sort of typically anglophone trial by jury system, or even if it's you know, the more kind of continental system where you have you just have a, a or a panel of judges who make the decision. Um, I would imagine it's quite difficult to convict, sorry, to convince a jury. Um, oh well, this guy, this this guy's guilty because the algorithm says so. I mean, I, I would like to see that case. But and, uh, like, isn't it so that there's already quite a few um, digital distributor <coughs> solutions? And so the at the centre we. I mean, in the long run, it's not so unforeseeable. No, it's not unforeseeable for, for small crime at least. I mean, well, what what we've looked at at the centre is the use, of, which is already happening actually, is the use of algorithms in predicting recidivism, which is. Uh, re well, actually, I think I'm in the EU, I'd say re-offending, 
sort of, you know, the kind of slightly more technical American English they call recidivism, but you know, the reoffending rates. So people who are up for parole, how likely are they to uh, go on to commit crime? And there is use of algorithms there, and obviously there are ethical concerns because that's quite a big decision. Um, and I would say in cases like that, explainability is a goal worth pursuing because, precisely because of the nature of that decision. But I would also say that parole hearings are notoriously unfair. And, and I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of drama films about this that you can watch as well. It's so, it's so long and it's made it into fiction. Um, you know, about the kinds of, of assumptions that parole boards make about, about uh, inmates. So the, the, the point there, I, mean, I think what I'm saying is, is that there would have to be legal change in order to deploy mm -hmm. AI in your current. But I want to come to the other point that you raised. And by the way, the reason I didn't read it say it, the question was because you have a nice loud voice and I'm, I'm absolutely mm -hmm. confident that everyone heard you. <laughs> and, um, but your other point was about, was interesting, was about giving algorithms the kind of bias you would want them to have. Now, I could be wrong, and this is why I'm going to who, but my understanding is that one of the the basic problems with artificial intelligence that has t one of the reasons it's it's taken us so long to get where we are is is that in order for an AI to do anything, it has to have a specific goal or purpose. I mean, and and even in the theoretical sense, I mean, if you want to get into science fiction, like the kind of the idea of the artificial general <coughs> intelligence, these these super intelligent machines, the, the theory is is that unless they were programmed with some specific goal, they wouldn't do anything. They wouldn't think, they wouldn't process anything. I mean, is, is that valid, or, as I said, have I been reading too much science fiction? No, it's certainly valid for the non-machine learning AI, because, uh, you know, obviously, uh, and in fact, in most of the, I, I, I deal with a lot of low applications in AI, be, be reassured, because most of the AI applications are in, in low, in just this uh, non-learning based. So, so in general, you know, this is, for instance, in Watson, you know, uh, Lego Watson, they help take decisions, but they basically what they help the lawyers to do is to process this huge amount of documentation of text that the lawyer has to process in order to take a decision. And if he's being helped by a computer, I guess you fully understand what kind of help you receive, and you can easily, you know, explain uh, to uh, to the perhaps the guilty person, whatever. Why is it so? You know, because uh, it's just a help. And I and I believe that the way this algorithm has been built is by really you know using and exploiting the the expertise of of, of law. You know, so so I guess at the end of the decision process, normally a lawyer today, 99% of the application that I know, you know, for instance, what's on base, they can easily explain why this decision has been taken. I haven't see, I've never seen a, a machine learning AI, for instance, deep learning. <laughs> Deciding about uh, about the, the, the penalty of the, of the fee, so we, you can be reassured on that. Now, on on, on, on your question about goal and non-goal, you know, what the problem with the, the, the machine learning AI, like for instance, uh, let's take uh, AlphaGo. You know, that that was an interesting thing. You know, AlphaGo succeeded to defeat the Go player, the best Go players, just by random and uh, you know random and fighting, just a random randomly playing. You know, he learns to play better than. That is really, you know, a, a, a very, a very, a, you know, this, this is why I was telling you that there is a key bifurcation taking place in AI these days, where more and more people tend to think, and for instance, Yojira Benjo, which is one of the five of deep learning, believe that all AI should be rewritten with reinforcement learning and machine learning. So in that case, if this happened, I don't believe it will ever happen, there are people really believing that, then we are in a bad situation because that would, exp that would show that most of the algorithms that are machine learning, reinforcement learning, playing by random and trial, and then it, they become more and more opaque. And we don't explicitate the goal, we don't really understand what happened, and, and this machine are performing well, and then the only justification is a statistical justification. And it's the only way you can explain why these algorithms are performing well, because you can't understand anything else. So if all AI is moving towards that, and there are big actors today in AI believing that AI is doing better like that, for instance, AlphaGo, there was, uh, you know, perhaps you know Deep Blue in chess. Deep Blue was really, you know, you couldn't understand Deep Blue. In fact, Kasparov was understanding how Deep Blue was playing. But he said he never understood how AlphaGo was playing. He was playing Go in a completely unusual way. And that, if all AI is moving to AlphaGo and you know, leaving Deep Blue, then it creates a lot of issue on explainability, justification, and whatever, whatever. Mm. Uh, there was another question here. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to sit, if it's okay, for health reasons. Uh, I'm Alexandra Kozak, I'm from uh, Weber Shandlik, and I have more of a personal question about AI itself, and you lead in AI, because I, I read many articles, like many opinions, saying that yes, 
China, US, EU is lagging behind, EU is lagging behind. Last uh, week I participated in an event with the representative of France Digital who said that yes, we want to lead in AI uh, and now on, I think 29th of March, France will uh, present its stra AI strategy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wanted, I have two questions concerning that Europe is lagging behind. Is there, I'm sorry, I'm super pessimist, my parents hate that, but I'm very pessimist. Do you think there is a chance for EU to catch up, at least, with China and US. Second question is why, like, why are we lagging behind? Is it only because of the resources, or is it because of the different, different priorities of all the member states? And um, also, I have a question about France claiming that they want to take the lead in EI. Do, is it something that we should be concerned uh, about regarding like the fact that EU wants to create a policy regarding AI and now France says, hey, we want to lead, we're going to we're gonna propose a strategy. I mean, does it, does it, is there any link between all of these actions? So your, your first question was, can you catch up? Your second question was, why are we lagging behind? Yes. And you, your third question about... It was about France yeah. and French strategy. I mean, national AI strategies. Yeah. Does it have a meaning for EU as a whole in, in creating the policy of like AI so approach? Should, should member states emulate what France is doing, in other words? Mm. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll... Go ahead. So that's a very complex question, and I think everybody in the room is wondering the same. Um, I think first um, to your question, why is Europe uh, lagging behind? Um, in China, they have access to data that's really incomparable to Europe uh, due to Europe fragmentation. So I think access to data is the first uh, answer. After, um, you can moderate that stand by saying, well, having a lot of data is not how you can make AI work efficiently. You need to have quality of data. And I think in Europe, um, we have a lot of quality of data. We are very good in terms of having the knowledge, the capabilities. So we have the potential. Now it's just a question of how you use that potential. Um, also, in parallel, you've got the problem about the narratives. Two, three years ago, you read, you were reading the media. AI was fantastic. Um, if you read the media now, it's about how Facebook is stealing your data and how Uber is crashing people and killing people. Um, so I think we really need to change the narrative. We need to <coughs> try to balance it. Um, we need to try to have quality uh, data in Europe and to use it smartly. Um, but also, we need to make sure that security and trust is there. Um, because online security is, for me, a real basis to privacy and to artificial intelligence. Um, to the question of France, well, I think Macron is very ambitious and he's trying to lead the way and he will offer an AI strategy and he works very closely with the Commission. Um, so I would say if all the 28 member states start having their own AI strategy, I would be super excited personally. Will it work? Um, I think it will be difficult because it's difficult to bring everybody around the table and to agree on their points and they will all be willing to defend their own strategy. But it's good to have at least two three member states showing the way and and I think being smart and, and trying to to go uh, after China and the US and in the long term I think we can catch up in the short term well we need to work Any other questions? Yes okay, I'll go ahead. So, so you mentioned earlier and uh, there's no shortage of um, startups for you to interview I'd be kind of interested to know where are all these startups in two or three years? Are they still going? Are they small companies, or have they been had looked for investment from a bigger player? And if they have, has that bigger player come from France or somewhere else in the EU or from the US? Um, so it wouldn't it wouldn't be appropriate for me to kind of point to specific people and where they're up to. But I, I mean, the, the one company that came to my mind that when I first spoke to them, they were a tiny startup and now they're, they're really growing. They moved to the US, and they set up an office in the US where they could attract investment. And when I asked them why, they were, they're a French company, 
and when I asked them why, and I mean the answer was it was it's just easy to bring in investors, um, and I think part of the answer to your second question may have something to do with the fact that obviously the EU is it's this very kind of unique supranational union. It's not a federal union, but it's also not a confederation of member states. It's it's something in between, and there's still quite a bit of fragmentation. We've got 28 and 27 different states and, and 25 primary languages without even accounting for all of the different languages that exist within the member states. I mean, it's, it's probably quite hard just from sort of practical business levels to kind of do the, the kind of the business side uh, on the same scale as you can in the US where, okay, really you have more like two de facto languages at least in, in terms of day-to-day -day life, then more than that in, in the cities. But you know, you've got a country where basically everyone you're going to be do, doing business with speaks one language. And, and in China, I don't want to make China too much of a comparison because it's a very different type of regime, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a single country. And I think that may be a factor, just kind of the business logistics. Um, and I would also say to add some note of optimism, that we haven't got onto, and this is, I mean, I, I abuse the neutral, the supposed neutrality chair, the moderator, all the time at these panels, and I, I hope I've done that successfully today as well. Um, one thing that I didn't mention at the start, because I wanted to give the panelists the opportunity to give their view, is that I do think there is a big opportunity for Europe in, dust, in, in using AI to make its heavy industry more efficient. I mean, the EU is still a leader in, in many types of high-tech heavy manufacturing. And I do think AI could, um, you know, drastically improve the German car industry, for example. Um, and on the point about France, um, I mean, I, I, I'm a great admirer of the French Republic, but I mean, they, they, they want to lead on lots of things. Um, <laughs> um, I would also, I mean, actually, the the AI strategy didn't start under the Macron presidency. This goes back to when Axel Mayer was the digital minister. Yeah, we yeah. right. So yeah, I mean, so she, she she was the minister in charge of this, and obviously her her career went up in smoke after she backed Melanie Sean in the the presidential election, and it's now got a new sort of hands managing this. But this this the strategy has been a long time coming, and it's it's not dependent on any particular political personalities, and so it's great that the current president is is encouraging it. But it's 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 something that's been building in France for crap for quite a while, and. Um, I mean, our position at the centre is we think national AI strategies are a good idea. Um, so we're quite excited to see what, what France comes out with. Um, we're a little bit over time, but we started kind of late, and Press Club seem they haven't told us to stop yet. So I'm going to allow one more question, if anyone wants to ask it. You'll be the privileged final <laughs> question of the day. But if nobody does, I'll wrap up. Can I have a... Follow up. You can have a follow-up question, sure. I have a follow-up question regarding the, the, the fact that we are a little bit slower because of the quality of data. So, just wanted to ask whether, do you think that GDPR is actually slowing down our way to, to like, AI and to being, you know, the first in the world in AI, whether it's also because of the GDPR, because now all these companies will be a little bit more busy with complying with the GDPR, and there are certain provisions that are, will be problematic for, for SMEs and, and, you know, AI technology companies. I will not exactly answer uh, your second question, but I will definitely answer the first one in Europe lacking behind. And in fact, uh, I, sh I share your pessimism. You know, in fact, initially I was telling that Europe should foster much more collaboration because I think there's a question of scale. You know, uh, as I was telling you when I was in Canada and I see you know be blowing up of you know what I've been doing in AI is incredible. And I'm afraid, but not only the private sector. In Europe is being invaded by the technologies coming from China and even the manufacturing sector, you know, because you were selling, you were, you were saying about the car, what you see what happened in the United States with Google car, you know, Apple car, whatever, Tesla. So this, even the, 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 the whole manufacturer, where, uh, uh, you know, Europe is really powerful. 
But because we're living in uh, you know, a world where more and more uh, you know, uh, uh, atom becomes bit, you know, this is a famous sentence. So, so bit is taking more and more importance you know, with respect to atom with a 3D printer and, and this kind of stuff. So I mean that we even right now losing the battle in the manufacturer sector, not only the uh, you know, information sector, but more and more in the manufacturer sector. And I'm very sharing your pessimism. I believe that Europe has to resist that and, and create a, a lot of opportunity for collaboration to reach that scale. You know, that what France will never do anything in, in alone. You know, I know a lot of my uh, <coughs> AI partners in France, they're good people, but most of them are fleeing to the United States right now, like Yann Le Camp. We, we often refer to Yann Le Camp, but he's, he's heading, you know, the Facebook round. So, so, I mean, we really have to make it at the European level. If we succeed, to create European collaboration uh, in, in, the, in the labs, we can do that. Because I'm afraid not only of the invasion of the private sector with uh, AI tools coming from the States and China, but also the public sector, which is even, you know, like, you know, the transportation today in our cities is being led by, you know, Google Map or Waze and uh, the, the, the energy transitions, you know, there's something like Nest, you, you know, the, uh, the things taking place in your home, like Alexia, whatever, the American things. So most of our lives today are being ruled by algorithms, you know, you know, originating in the United States. So this is really critical because the consumers want that because they're very efficient, they're very agile. You know, they, our policy is pretty conservative, pretty low, pretty, and it's hard to be agile in a monster like Europe. You know, but I don't know. This, I share your pessimism. Thank you. you can, and then we'll and I can see Karina wants to say but please keep your comments really quick because we have to. Okay. So are you yeah, first, enough. last, no, 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 no. I take over. <laughs> so on the GDPR, is the GDPR slowing down the process? You could argue, you, you could probably find many arguments to say yes, because first of all, you need to have, as I said before, uh, before you touch personal data, before you process personal data, you need to think of your legal basis, and that will apply, to, you know, to everybody. Yeah, so you can argue that. But you could, I think you can also make the argument that at the end of the day, whatever you do is built on a much better foundation because you already thought about it and you are also thought about the safeguards you have to apply and also the technical protection barriers. And as um, Victoria said, you know, you need to build the trust and this is how you build the trust. So I would, I would argue that in the long run it remains to be seen. I wouldn't be as, as pessimistic. And then, you know, coming back to the ethical issues, you know, growth at all costs. And AI at all co costs, I think in Europe we will say no. You know, facial recognition as, as one of the AI technologies, apply that everywhere. You know, you, you, you monitor somebody who, who crosses a red red traffic light and, you know, I don't think we want that. And and so in the long run we need to, to have that, that debate, definitely. Yeah, but European things and the United States act. This is really, you know, one of the problems is that we think too much. And sometimes we try to, I mean, this is kind of philosophy in Europe, which is very different from the American and Chinese philosophy, which are much more pragmatic. You know, they do things and then they see what happens and they judge the consequence and they, you know, act afterwards. In Europe, we try to make a lot of barrier and, and we tend to, this is kind of philosophy, the European philosophy, you know, I, I've crossed this philosophy all along the research, and oh, I'm actually sure that this will work, private life, convergence, whatever. I think this is one of the big philosophical mistakes of Europe. I'm, I'm more and more adapted of the pragmatic philosophy, just do things and see what happens. Can I get the last word? Okay, sorry, I lost my train of thought that having interrupted sorry. you. Um, <laughs> but just to, just to come back, um, you mentioned the idea of, um, you know, companies coming in to developing all the tools coming into Europe. Um, I mean, the tools that are developed, if they're going to be um, sold into the EU market, are going to have to be GDPR compliant. So, you know, it's not, you know, it's kind of not the end of the world, right? Uh, they're, going to have to, they're going to have to follow those rules, other because, because companies in the EU are not going to be able to buy products and rely on them unless they're GDPR compliant. Okay. Um, that's it. I can see a lot of people need to get off. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. I've enjoyed this. Um, and as I said, please do take the reports with you and study them. There should be enough for everyone. Have a great day. And thank you to our panelists.